Which Side Podcast is a proud member of the Which Side Media Collective. This is episode 58. Yeah, we have Janae on from, uh, she's producer of Maximum Tolerated Dose. She also has a vegan bakery. Yeah, Apocalypse Now. That's an awesome name. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, uh, awesome vegan activist from Toronto area. So it'd be an awesome title for a cookbook. I would hope. I'd love to see one from her. Yeah, totally. That'd be amazing. Hopefully, we should soon. pitch that. We should. Hey, if you're listening, make us a, an awesome cookbook. Yeah, yeah. cookbook pie clips. <laughs> well, she should make it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. listening. She should make it. Yeah. I don't that's think what we're it, saying. If anyone else makes it, you're an ass. Yeah, you're just stealing. Yeah, at fuck that point. you. Yeah, that's not cool. Yeah. Yeah. We well, had a really good time. Um, Check out local events in your area. Yeah, uh, we're which still, podcast.com. Yeah, we're still doing uh, locally here in Utah. We're doing horse drawn carriage demonstrations. And every, I'm sure they're Friday going on in other areas of the country also. Yeah, so um, I mean, check out your local areas for demonstrations and other events. And uh, check out which side podcast. And you know what? If you don't see any events going on in your area, fucking start one. Yeah. Don't and we have ta- to be big. We'll yeah. promote it for you. Yeah, we talk about it. If you want something to happen, just do it. Just fucking do it. Yeah, we have a uh, we still have the wish list going on right now. Um, for anybody that wants to get us an item from our wish list, we'll give you a membership to the podcast. Wow, Jordan! Yeah, do you have affordable things on this wish list? Yeah, there is something on there. It, like price was like three bucks. It's actually true. It was really awesome. Is that everything on the wish list is something we actually use and need? Yeah, um, we we'll either go for this podcast or uh, podcast in the collective to help the rest of the collective. I'll give someone super props if they get us that headphone amp. Oh my god, we so need that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, it's so annoying. It's like twenty bucks or something. Yeah, it's like twenty. I think it's like twenty bucks. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just to check it out. Uh, if you already have a membership, or if you don't have a membership, you can also gift it. So mm-hmm. if you buy something on the wish list and uh, you want to give it at the membership as a gift to somebody, we'll mm-hmm. we'll do that also. Yeah. If you don't know who to give it to, but you'd like to, we will gladly uh, give it out for you. Yeah. So check that out, wishipodcast.com. Anything else? Uh, uh, enjoy. enjoy. How's it going? Good. How are you? Doing good. I'm Jordan. I'm Jeremy. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Good. It's snowy, but good. <laughs> oh, that's why I just got a huge cup of tea. <laughs> how's the How's the snow in Canada where you're at? I know you just said two feet, but yeah, we got like assaulted by snow last night and all day today i've shoveled three times and given up now and i've decided to just shovel myself out in the morning (laughs) (laughs) so how far up north are you Um, i'm not really far north but um toronto gets a lot of lake effect snow because Mm. we're right on the great lakes so buffalo toronto like all of us just get slammed a couple of times a year that sucks yeah yeah, I mean, I grew up here, so I'm used to it. Like, it doesn't really feel like winter unless there's, like, a day where, like, I can't get out of the house. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, like, we're in Utah, and I've grown up in Utah my whole life, so we're not, like, used, like, we're used to snow, mm-hmm. and we're used to, like, the heavy winters, but fuck, you guys get it unbelievably worse than we do. Yeah, when I, I grew up north of here, like, almost three hours north of here in the snow belt. And we used to have to go out and shovel the snow off the roof of my house so that the weight of it wouldn't crush the house. <laughs> oh, man. Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's a little different. We, and we, my sh- mom we has to take snowmobiles to work and stuff like that when they can't get the cars out because the snow gets up past the car doors and you can't actually dig them out. And so... Toronto is so mild compared to that. And then, you know, I talked to somebody like Jeff who grew up in California and he just can't <laughs> relate to this at all. <laughs> yeah, I was talking you know, last week, I was talking to somebody up in the Northwest Territories 
And they're like, oh, you know, what's the weather like? Oh, it's negative six right now. And he's like, oh, it's negative 34. You're in t-shirt weather. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we're in negative 22 right now. Jeez. Is that Just Celsius or Fahrenheit? Celsius. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what we're at. I don't know Celsius. the, I don't I know the difference. <laughs> I do math. know negative 40 is the same. <laughs> As what? Celsius up. and Fahrenheit. Negative 40 is the same. Huh. Interesting. That's weird. Math. <laughs> yeah yeah we uh we pretty much never have a snow day though that's for sure yeah yeah do you you ever get snowed in where you do have snow days oh yeah when we were kids like it used to happen all the time um because i lived in such a rural area like my town only had two thousand people yeah um so 80 percent of my high school and public school were bussed in so if the snow was like even you know we got eight inches overnight or something, they would have to cancel the buses because the plows that couldn't get out in time. And if the buses were canceled, there would only be like three kids in your class. So you just got to stay home. And so like the best days were like, it would get so snowy <laughs> that school would be canceled. My brother and I would basically just like bomb out the door because you wouldn't know until 8 a.m. Yeah. When it didn't happen, so you're already up. And we would just like bundle up and bomb out the door, like literally toboggan until we were so tired. We would just like <laughs> drag ourselves back home. <laughs> that's so awesome just yeah it an, was pretty sweet just an fyi i checked we're at negative six celsius right now okay that's not too bad that's actually not bad at all yeah this weather <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're saying that jeff uh he, he wasn't used to it when he came up there or was it not uh... well it wasn't it wasn't really cold when he was here thankfully uh -huh. like it was still warm enough that we could like bike around and stuff like that but oh, that's uh, good but yeah i uh I guess it doesn't get even it doesn't even get this cold like in Portland and stuff like that. So oh, I have no, no. no concept of <laughs> of any place other than this place and worse than this. So Antarctica's this is gonna be a little bit place. chillier. Yeah. <laughs> Culture shock for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so so how is it growing up vegan in like a climate like that? Um, like in the cold climate like yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've only been vegan for, I think, five or six years. Uh -huh. Um, my mom is actually vegan, though, and she still lives in the little town. <laughs> and she's managed to get her whole grocery store to, like, stock all this vegan stuff, like vegan A's and, like, diet cheese and stuff like that, because she just goes and talks to the manager, um, because it's, like, this guy up the street from her, you know? So oh, awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> It's been, she said that it's actually way easier for her because whatever she kind of wants them to stock, she talks to them and um, other people in our, like their community have been trying veganism. Like um, my stepdad went vegan for over a year and he had, um, he's got diabetes and other things like that. And his doctor basically was like, what are you doing? And he was like, oh, well, I, I went vegan. And the doctor was like, well, I'm going to give it a try. Like, you don't even have to convince me because like, I can see the difference in your checkup oh, wow. <laughs> that whatever you did is working and the doctor himself also had diabetes and so it's interesting because they're sort of like spreading it in this really passive way um <laughs> in this like little town which is which is kind of crazy now like the coffee shop has soy milk and all this stuff that like when i used to go visit my mom it was like a wasteland and now it's like <laughs> it's really it's really awesome so did your mom become vegan because of you or did you become vegan because of your mom? Um, my mom became be vegan because of me. Um, she, I, like, I have a bakery called Apocalypse now. Mm -hmm. And um, I was tabling at the vegetarian festival here, which is the largest uh, vegetarian food fest in North America. And um, it's like three days long and it's got a full vegan policy and um, there's speakers and there's like showcases and booths and all this stuff. And um, my mom had come down to like support me being at the fair and sat in on a bunch of talks with my stepdad just to kill time during the day. And I hadn't seen her in like eight hours. And finally she comes up to the booth at the end of the day and literally her and my stepdad are like hips to chin stacked with books. And all of them say stuff like becoming vegan, defeating diabetes. And I was just like, what did you do? <laughs> and my mom just yelled out, we're vegan. <laughs> and I was like, I leave you alone for eight hours. <laughs> I've been trying to talk to you about this for four years. And like Dr. Gregor like wraps this thing up for me in 30 minutes. Wow. That's amazing. 
that's, that's what's amazing is like now you can sit back and you can see the influence of what that visit had on the entire community now uh-huh. yeah and so yeah. it's a really cool like ripple effect and you know my mom she was like my favorite time was when she was in her first like angry year because like I always say like everybody has like a first angry year of being vegan where you're like you know <laughs> you're checking ingredients of things and you're just getting enraged like every day like <laughs> yeah. I can't buy chips like you're just like mad right <laughs> and um I love thinking of my mom in her first angry year because she was like you know this like 50 year old woman and she kind of looks she's a blend of like kitty foreman from that 70s show and like peggy hill um <laughs> and so she's just this adorable like little woman and she was like you know they gave her milk and her coffee once by accident she's like and i spit it out it was so gross <laughs> <laughs> i love thinking of her being in this small town and like spitting coffee out <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because so, like yeah every vegan kid i know their parents are always the hardest ones they ever talk to and it's mm-hmm. you know the hardest ones to change and you know you, it's amazing that you know an outsider can have so much an influence where you, they, your own kids it's just almost a lost cause sometimes yeah no for sure and like and um i've got like um nieces and nephews and stuff like that and it's really interesting to see them become really curious about it also just because like um i don't know it's weird i feel like different people come at it for different reasons like with my mom it was she came at it really from a health perspective Mm -hmm. um and then brought in all the animal stuff like after the fact Mm -hmm. but like my my niece who's like 14 every time she talks to me she just wants to talk to me about animals like i feel like i could get her there in like an afternoon if i could just get her away from my sister long enough (laughs) Do do you have that guilt about doing it with with them with like my nieces and nephews yeah it's that weird that weird guilt of like i know my sister's gonna be pissed if i talk to their kid (laughs) <laughs> yeah and my sister would be pissed off too but i think only because it would just complicate her life a whole lot to have to try to manage that um <laughs> like she would be like thank you for adding another rebellious element to my teenage daughter <laughs> <laughs> and then i go home to toronto and just leave her to deal with it forever um but like no i feel like I, i'm not really like trying i like i haven't really given them you know the the toolkit like i haven't told them you know here's the connection you can make between like animals and what you're choosing to eat um and it's called veganism and here's how you do it um Mm -hmm. because i feel like that that's kind of you know that's stepping in to like you know her parenting and so on and so forth but i do definitely talk to them about like the intelligence of animals and the compassionate side of animals and i tell them stories and stuff and just like kind of plant those seeds Mm -hmm. um because like i did masters like a master's degree in um veganism as a social movement and Mm -hmm. one of the uh the things i read about was that a lot of people who end up becoming animal rights activists or vegetarians or vegans later in life can trace it back to being a child and having some sort of like individual connection to an animal like um that's like typically used for food um like something that just kind of breaks breaks that that glass a little bit um and so I like to just kind of supplement their knowledge about animals with information that they probably aren't getting access to on a regular basis, because I think that it will be much easier for them to make that connection later. Weren't you, uh, Jeremy, having like an issue with your nephew and he was asking a lot of questions and like, and he was saying that I like, like, I like Jeremy's milk better than I like. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah um, like I have a couple nephews that they totally prefer, you know, like soy milk. They prefer the soy cheeses. Um, and I think it has more to do with my daughter though. Cause I mean, she's a huge influence on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's always the ones that are like, you know, why do you have a pig on your plate? And they're like, well, that's ham. And she's like, no, that's a pig. Don't you understand <laughs> this? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's, it's crazy though. But the, uh, the influence my daughter that I'm really worried about, you're talking about your sister, you know, and her rebellious teenagers is, you know, my daughter's being raised by, you know, vegan anarchists that are atheists. Like, so how the fuck is she going to rebel? Like that's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. Like maybe she, maybe she won't rebel. Maybe you guys should just get like really get really like, you know, preppy for like a few years. In the there, so <laughs> she thinks she's rebelling by being punk. <laughs> 
Be like, no, you can't dye your hair. Not, a, not in my house. <laughs> Just like, fake her out. <laughs> she she gets weirded out. Like her biggest rebellion right now is like she won't cuss at all. And like oh, I yeah. don't care if she cusses. Like, where the fuck do I care? Right? But she she's like, no, I'm I'm a little girl and little girls don't say things like shit and damn. Like <laughs> So her rebellion is not cussing. Uh, yeah, like <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> All the other parents are like, "Man, well played." <laughs> I I did have to get on her for yelling at the horse carriages last week because she knows you're not supposed to yell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny though. Yeah, like that's the the things like that we have to deal with. Like it's no, I wouldn't ever complain about that. Yeah. So. You know, I've never had an issue with her eating vegetables. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It's the long game. It totally. <laughs> so how's uh, how's the animal rights activism in uh, Toronto? Uh, Toronto is um, Toronto's like it's a pretty mixed bag over here. Um, we've got a really active community sort of in southern Ontario. I like to say more than just focused on Toronto. Um <laughs> Because there's a lot of campaigns that happen kind of basically from here all the way up to like the border to Buffalo um, through the Niagara region as well. Um, because as you know, like Marine Land, I don't know if you know, um, is yeah. in Niagara Falls, which is about an hour and a half from here. And so we work closely with um, activists from the Niagara region as well as people from Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of us sort of coordinate on each other's campaigns, which is it's a really it's a really awesome community yeah that's uh, awesome for that like we're lucky because we have like a cluster of cities all maybe five or six active cities within two hours of each other so we like to do convergence kind of stuff so that we get a lot more people out um but yeah the scene's really awesome um marine land animal defense which is a group that i organize with um we've been getting consistently demos of five six hundred people um we had one of over 1000 people at marine land the last two summers wow um which has been really awesome there was one night one day closing day um two years ago we actually had a spontaneous group of 100 people storm the gates and hop the turnstiles and shut down the dolphin show (laughs) (laughs) wow that's great which was awesome. Um, the aftermath was less awesome because uh, one of my good friends, Dylan Powell, uh, picked up a $1.5 million lawsuit. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, which we're still fighting right now. Um, but yeah, that campaign's really active in the summer, but it's a seasonal campaign. Um, the winter things kind of slow down because like, we get totally snowed in. <laughs> yeah. And most of the animal enterprises around here um, close um, because they're seasonal places so there's a place called african lion safari just outside of the city um and they have like lions and giraffes and you know like baboons like just loose and you drive your car through and then you know the baboons descend onto your car and tear everything off of it and people pay money to go in and you know gawk at these bored animals living in a northern climate um, that have to basically be in barns half of the year in order to be out. Um, There was a campaign against the Bowmanville Zoo, which is an hour and a half from here, um, recently, which had Canada's oldest elephant, um, who actually died a week and a half ago now, or last week. Um, Her name was Limba, and we had been working on the campaign to move her to pause for a really long time. Um, unfortunately, without success, like three days before she died, they had her dressed up as Santa and marching Jeez. in their parade um, for their small town That's for their sickening. like Christmas parade. Yeah, they use her, they rent her out to anybody who wants her, store openings, whatever. So she spent her entire life um, basically uh, being carted around and dressed up and painted and all these horrible things. So Just a, disgusting. A fucking living prop. Yeah. Exactly. And she was also living in solitude, um, which is really horrible for female elephants. So especially so we were really active against that campaign. Um, And then we also had we do a lot of circus stuff in the summer as well, because the shrine circus comes through and they bring tigers and elephants. And we had two years ago this summer, we ran a pressure campaign um, where we literally went to every single show within like southern Ontario. And when they came back the year after that, they canceled half of those shows. 
oh, wow. because of the turnout that had come out just to protest them. So um, they won't go back to Niagara <laughs> or Waterloo. So what's the, the general population uh, reaction to uh, your guys' style of activism? Um, we actually have a really diverse set of um, styles in Toronto. Um, I kind of roll with the bullhorn set <laughs> um, <laughs> because I kind of really like bullhorns. And I like, um, there's like a group of people that go directly to the source of exploitation and confront the people who are doing the exploitation. Um, then there's a whole other group of people um, there are a bunch of other dedicated activists that um, have like witnessing campaigns and vigil campaigns, and they go out twice a week to um, Slaughterhouse in downtown Toronto, and they literally bear witness to the pigs um, coming into the Slaughterhouse facility, and they take pictures of all of the pigs, and they give them water um, in the summer when it's hot, and they have to sit for hours in the trucks waiting to go into the Slaughterhouse so that they're not um, dehydrating and suffering needlessly. Um, and then there's a whole other group of people who literally just do outreach to the omnivore population and they do food giveaways and they do postcard giveaways and they screen films and they do all that kind of stuff. And so, um, we have a big enough population here that, um, there's a group for every kind of activism that you want to do basically in Toronto. With, with it being so cold, do you have a lot of like furriers and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. We have a fur district in Toronto. Oh, um, there are, I mapped it two years ago, which I call it's, um, you can see it online. It's the fur free Toronto death map. And um, I mapped every furrier in Toronto. And I got over 65 without even going to stores that are trim stores, like wow. just people who sell full fur coats, Holy or fuck. fur blankets, or fur, like, you know, um, you know, wraps and shawls and things like that. Like people who are like considered furriers or skin dealers or storage facilities. Um, and so, yeah, we have, um, we have our fur free Friday March. We actually marched to eight different stores that are all within three blocks of each other that are full furriers. In, in Canada, does most of that fur come from uh, imports or is that locally trapped or is it locally raised in farms? Um, it's a whole lot of everything. Um, mm -hmm. There's tons of farms. There's a really big farm outside of um, Toronto, but an hour outside of Toronto. Um, my friends over at a group called Koala, which is K-O-A-L-A, -A, like, um, which is Kitchener, Ontario Animal Liberation Alliance. Um, it's my friend Wendy facilitates with that group, and they're awesome. They've recently just started actually demoing at one of the largest fur farms in the area. Um, and it's never had anybody demo directly at it before. So they've ramped up pressure um, since that farm's really close to them, um, to the, the farmed fur. Um, in addition to that, we have trap lines all over the place here to catch coyotes. Um, I don't know if you guys have Canada goose jackets there yet. You will. <laughs> they just got purchased by um, the same conglomerate that owns Staples and all of these other things. And they basically sell these like down filled, hideous, you know, Arctic expedition looking jackets. And all of them are trimmed with wild caught coyote fur. Um, so we have a huge amount of Canadian wild coyotes being caught, like with leg hold traps um, mm -hmm. by not even like indigenous populations, but like, you know, white trappers and um, sold at a couple of different like fur exchanges in Ontario, most of which happen so far north that it's almost impossible for activists to get to them. Yeah. And so it's really unfortunate, but like that's been a huge resurgence in fur is that like these coats are now wildly popular. <laughs> like you can't walk around Toronto for more than two or three minutes without seeing one. Yeah, I've um, never heard of using coyote before. Yeah, it's like this this new thing that they're they're trying to bring back is using like wild coyote fur for the hoods. Because um, what's interesting, like uh, in the state that we're in, in Utah, you can legally hunt coyote as um, as varmin, or they, they, it's you don't even need a license for it. Yeah, yeah, they, that's why they use the fur. It's like junk fur here um, because they're pests. Yeah, it's considered yeah. cleanup if you kill them. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we have we're almost all fur farms and like I think two furriers in the entire state. Yeah, there was um 
there was Lords Blanc, which was downtown. And but they closed. They've recently closed for unknown reasons. And then um, in Park City, like where Sundance Film Festival takes place, there's um, there's three shops that are all kind of right across the street from each other. And then there's one down the, the way that's owned by the same, same one of people. the same companies. Yeah. So um, that's about like the major fur distributors here, which is mm-hmm. really odd for having so many fur farms. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, too- we we have a lot of imported fur here. I'm sure that the fur that you guys are, you know, seeing on farms there is ending up places like here. Without without a doubt, I I know that. Uh, yeah, I drove by the largest one in the state today. Yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah, in the in the United States, probably. I think it is in the United States. Yeah, yeah. but um, it always makes me sad yeah. thinking about it. God. Unfortunate. Uh, but um, yeah. So you've worked on a. You had a producer role in Maximum Tolerated Dose? Yes, I did. <laughs> I have the hardest time even watching any Amorites videos. Yeah. How do you take on a role like producing one? Um, I mean, I really have to sort of give a lot of credit to Carl. Um, the director is mm-hmm. Carl Arjahovsky. I don't know if you've um, ever talked to him or if you know him. Um, he's one. He's like my best friend. And he is so good at doing undercover work and sort of like getting his head in the right mindset to do this kind of stuff. Um, He took on the bulk of filming and editing and sifting through countless hours of footage that was donated to the film um, and picking it all out. Like I more had a support role. Um, And one of the reasons the film isn't, like particularly graphic is because both of us had talked about how we would like to make something that we could show our parents. Um, and we really didn't want like that empathy avoidance thing to kick in where you show somebody some really gruesome stuff and they just, they can't process it. So they tune it out Mm -hmm. and they tune out what you're telling them and they tune out feeling it and they tune out listening. And, um, so yeah, um, that was, that was Carl. Carl basically, Carl took a bullet for the rest of us because I know that he saw some really gruesome stuff. And I know that he saw a lot of really gruesome stuff firsthand doing that. Um, So I'm really thankful that I only had a producing role because I don't know that I would have been able to kind of metabolize it in the same way that he's been able to. Um, And that just comes from years of doing the work and sort of being as professional and dedicated as he is. Yeah, I mean, I I can't imagine doing it. I can't even get through like Earthlings. Oh, I've never been able to get through. Yeah, Earthlings. I mean, I <laughs> I always start sitting down to watch it, and it's just like I don't need to see this. I already know. Like, yeah, I'm like I'm the maximum amount of vegan I could possibly be. Yeah, like, I don't need I don't need to watch Earthlings. Earthlings is all that's gonna do is just like ensure that I never sleep comfortably again. Um, you know, like I couldn't, I couldn't be more like, you know, angry about what happens to animals and I couldn't be more active in the the animal rights community and I couldn't be more vegan, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't have any desire to, to put that, that imagery into my mind. Cause like I have a near photographic memory too, so I can't unsee anything. (laughs) Um, and I'm just like, I started, I got maybe, I think eight minutes into it and I was Mm -hmm. just like, you know what? Like, I'm just. I'm not. I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> I think I've made it 15. I think that's about as far as I made it. I, yeah. I only watched it because I, um, for the longest time I was avoiding it, but I I watched it with somebody else because they said they wouldn't watch it without me. So Ugh. that's how I had to sit through it, and it's terrible. This is the type of uh, in a good, a, terrible a one parent I am. My daughter pleaded to watch it, and she did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I let her watch it. But that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So are there are there any that um any documentaries that you that you have watched and you do enjoy? Um I'd have to think about that. Um for me like I'm really I guess like the right word for it would be like as a person who like I learn from like visual stuff like a lot like that's I learn from like doing and seeing predominantly. Mm-hmm. 
And so I'm really choosy about what I, I watch. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was anything that I've seen recently that I really like cared for. Um, unfortunately, like I wish it had been something visual or some kind of film or something like that, that had, um, made me connect to veganism, but unfortunately, like it wasn't at all. And since I made the decision to go vegan, I've not really seeked out a lot of documentaries. Um, so, so what led you to be uh, making the decision to go vegan? Um, it was actually, um, I tell everybody like the sort of the linchpin in all of my politics uh, is being a feminist because um, I was a feminist activist basically from when I was like 12 years old on. My mom raised me to be a really aggressive feminist and um so eventually, like, I came to veganism by basically looking at um, sort of the use of female bodies in animal agriculture mm -hmm. and the abuse of female bodies in animal agriculture. And, you know, I, uh, I got really into um, being, you know, part of the pro-choice movement and getting really, you know, well-versed in body autonomy and... Um, and sort of like individual rights to your own self and to live your own life and that kind of stuff. And once I made the connection that my choices and what I was eating weren't syncing up with my politics as a feminist um, in virtually every way, it was literally no turning back. Like from that moment, I was just like, okay, cool. Like it's done. And that, that was the turning point for me. And it didn't really have anything to do with, um, sort of seeing what kind of suffering they went through or things like that. It was as simplistic as, you know, deciding that I didn't have dominion over other people's bodies or other animals' bodies or other beings' bodies. Um, so I actually came to veganism through pro-choice activism, okay. <laughs> which is a weird sort of route. <laughs> no, I mean, to me, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with uh, Deep Green Resistance and their, um, their transphobia issues? Yes, I am. Like, how do you take that as, as coming from the feminist standpoint? I mean, I'm I'm of the perspective that I don't think that anybody has the right to tell somebody else who they are. Um, and I'm like one of the things that I'm really disgusted by as a feminist is the way that um, white feminists and radical feminists um, carry on with all of these sort of like rules and guidelines and you know, their slut walks and all this stuff where they completely ignore the the struggles and conditions of other women and trans women are included in that. Like trans women have a hard enough time <laughs> existing in the world without other women tearing them down um, and telling them no and not creating spaces where they're safe. And so, I mean, I just think it's despicable when anybody um, uses an advan like an advantageous position that they have or an audience that they have in order to oppress or tear down or diminish somebody else's experience in the world. And I feel like that's what Deep Green Resistance has been doing for a really long time. And I feel like that's what radical feminists have been doing for a really long time. Like, I don't think there's anything radical about, you know, being like anti-sex worker and being anti- trans women and you know like i just i just have been really disappointed by that mm -hmm. um and i feel like it's really unfortunate that we are in a place now where people are starting to equate that kind of thinking with the wave of feminism that myself and so many other women that i know who are really radical people and really cool people um you know like that this deep green resistance and this sort of really hideous feminism is taking hold in a lot of people who want feminism to be a really kind of elite little club of you know white women <laughs> and that's it you know yeah i mean i i have so many issues with uh deep green resistance on top of their transphobia issues mm -hmm. I, I don't ever talk to anyone who is actually in support of almost of that, that organization almost at all but you know you hear that all the support that they get, you know, across the U.S. and it always just dumbfounds me, like how people don't see the connections of, like, you know, what they're saying. Yeah, 
I mean, I think that that's, that's a lot of um, ignorance on the part of people who don't understand sort of the nuanced differences between different kinds of feminism. Um, when I was coming up through university, I had a really hard time separating and dis like making the distinctions between different types of feminists. And it's really important um, that people do that um, because like I was sitting in a lot of classes, for example, and, you know, the literature would say, you know, all porn, for example, is uh, oppressive to women. And then I would go talk to actual women who do say like, you know, uh, they're cam girls, but they're their own boss, mm -hmm. right? And I would be like, oh, so your porn isn't oppressive to you. Your porn is empowering you and you chose it. And the same with sex workers. Yeah, there's a lot of problems with sex workers as an industry or as a, a group of um, people who have been sort of oppressed by um, pimps or trafficked and all of these things are very real issues but you can't just say it's all bad because I know people who are sex workers and I know that they really like the line of work that they're in and they take a lot of pride in that work um and so it's really difficult to sort of kind of shake people out of this idea that this is a simplistic movement or that this is something that can be distilled into very simplistic terms and I think that that's what deep green resistance does and it appeals to people who don't want to do the critical work to think about the world around them. They want to say like, vagina equals woman. That's easy. I'm a woman, you're not. And like, let's just keep everything really clearly defined. And, you know, the world doesn't slice up that way anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, gender is not that easily defined at all. No. No. Yeah. And gender is fluid. I know a lot of people mm -hmm. who have completely fluid genders. Their genders are different day to day and that's just how they feel and it doesn't hurt me that's what i always say to people like whenever i'm getting i'm talking to somebody who's really irate about these kind of things i always just say to them like does this hurt you are you hurt by this is this like reaching into your life and, and taking something away from you like why do you care if yesterday they said they were a woman and today they're a man yesterday they were a woman and today they are a man like get over it just deal with your deal with yourself <laughs> but i don't know it's just really it's it's it speaks to sort of the, the political laziness of people. And I think that we're, we're seeing a lot more of that. We've got like almost like a nanny state developing in, in social justice and political actions where everybody just waits for you to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you say, today we're going to call this person. And it's like, why couldn't you have called them yesterday? Why don't you call them tomorrow? It's like, today we're going to write letters to prisoners. And it's like, or just write them all the time. Like everybody's <laughs> like, they're waiting. They want, they show up to the demos and they're like, where are the signs? And it's like, I don't know. Did you bring a sign? <laughs> like <laughs> they want signs. They want chant sheets. They want, you know, they want to know when to show up and where to go. And they want the route in advance and they want a contact person and they want all this stuff. And is the media going to come? Cause I don't know if we should go if the media is not going to be there. It's like, of course we're going to go. We're going to, because we're going to yell at people who own first stores. We're not going to get on MTV, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like people, people are really, they really want you to do the work for them. And I think that's why deep green resistance is like able to keep this hold on people because deep green resistance comes out like every, you know, asshole in the world and says, I have all the answers and here they are. <laughs> and people like lists and people like to be told that everything is as easy as you're good if you do this and you're bad if you do this and everything's clearly defined and you're an activist if you go here at this time and do this thing for half an hour, you know, like they, they want the positive associations of belonging to the group without actually having to do the work themselves. And I think that that's why we're seeing such a lag right now too, is that people don't realize that they can organize themselves and they can organize other people and then we can all organize together. Like my favorite thing to say to people all the time as an organizer in this community, they'll come to me and say, why haven't you organized the demo against the aquarium yet? And I'll say to them, why haven't you organized the demo against the aquarium? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my favorite question I always get is, you know, I, I want to do this. I want to, you know, create this campaign. How do I do that? Well, you do it. Do it. Like that, yeah. you, that's, you, you, I can't <laughs> tell you how to create your own campaign. If you can't find yeah. campaign materials, make them. Yeah. Like, it's like you're already doing it. That's the, the question. You did it. Yeah. You just started it. <laughs> you, <there> you, <laughs> that's, that's what's really great about the DIY culture. And I think that like for me, it came from like my upbringing and punk and stuff like that. Just the idea that anything that I want to do, I can always do it myself if I mm -hmm. have to. And so mm -hmm. I think, I mean, 
that's just something that is awesome that I wish more people would just grasp that. Like I remember like when we started the podcast, people would ask us all the time, well, how do you start a podcast? We're like, I don't we, fucking know. We, we just, just start it. it. <laughs> like we, we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> Exactly. You fake it till you make it. Exactly. <laughs> We're still faking it. So I mean, I'm still faking it too. I'm faking it every time I leave my house. I'm like, what if no one shows up? And I'm like, well, if no one shows up, then no one will see how badly you failed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's true. Win -win. I've, I've done demos where two people showed up. I've been by myself. <laughs> I, yeah, definitely. Some of my favorite demos ever have been demos where just like three of us showed up because it's yeah. like three people and I know them all like really well. Like, we had a circus demo, and it was myself and Dylan Powell from Marineland Animal Defense and maybe one or two other people. And when we don't have other people that we don't know who we kind of have to be, like, you know, on our best behavior with, um, we have a way, like, better time. Um, because we can just sort of, like, really run with it without worrying about the optics of the situation to, mm -hmm. you know, other activists and we were standing in line and, um, you know, you know, jeering at the people who are going into the circus to buy tickets and, you know, appealing to them not to go in. And uh, there was these two like bros, like shirtless bros and like <laughs> board shorts, flip flop standing in the line. And they're like 21. And we were like, what is going on? You guys are going to the circus together? Like, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> And then they started like laughing at us and pointing at us and whatever. And then Dylan just ended up yelling to them like, I don't know how you guys found time to go to the circus between gym tan laundry. <laughs> 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 and I was like, this is why I love it when it's just like three of us. <laughs> because other people would have been like, you shouldn't insult these bros. <laughs> but I was just like, that's my favorite moment all summer. <laughs> so yeah it's uh every, it's not everything's you know everything's fluid sometimes a hundred people's awesome and sometimes three people's awesome my, my favorite circus demo fact is this one and this is only because it's so personal for me is uh i met my wife at a circus demo um oh. she was actually going to see it we were demoing outside they ended up not going to see it and about three years later i ran into her again and she was vegan oh cool yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's my sister. That is your sister. <laughs> yeah. And that's a weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, though. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it's really weird seeing, like, the ripple effects of things you do. And, like, not... It's, I, I like the idea of not seeing a lot of them, but knowing that they exist out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? I wish there was a, a good way of um, documenting you know, the ripple effects of yeah. people's consequences and their actions. Yeah, like Google Analytics, but like for life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Life, life analytics. Get, get pingbacks on like <laughs> that person that you talked to that seemed really interested. <laughs> you know, the NSA already has it. We just need to ask. <laughs> exactly, yeah. There you go. Just tap into that and you can make a product. <laughs> <laughs> so, so speaking of the NSA... Uh, how how is the Canadian government like with activism and activist repression, or, or is, is it as big of an issue up there as it is for us? Um, I mean, our political system is stacked up like totally differently than the United States, and so they still they're total jerks, but you know, they use completely different sort of tools. Like we don't have grand juries here, yeah. um, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> but. Yeah. It's uh, also like we have a completely different sort of system of um, basically like the government can gain access to a lot of our stuff um, completely unchecked. Um, we don't have like an FBI, but we have like CSIS, but they're not as pervasive. But um, the cops, for example, can get access to a lot of information about you um, pretty easily. Um, cops can go either way here. Like we've got, for like example, like Marineland, we get a thousand people out and they'll send like six cops. <laughs> <laughs> when we stormed the gates, it was like, it was one, it was hilarious because they only had two cops. That <laughs> and there was a 1,100 people and Rick O'Berry's there. And it's like, <laughs> it was like massive. And so like, we just literally like pushed up to the gates and then the owner of the park like pulls up in his truck 
and somebody yells out, there he is, there's John Holler. <laughs> and the cops had to stream into the park. Like these two cops have to jump the turnstiles and they're like pushing him into his truck. Like, get out of here, you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and all these people just sort of like, like pouring over the turnstiles and they're like radioing for more cops. But like Niagara Falls is a small town. And so they don't have that many cops. And so <laughs> by the time the other cops got there, there's like a hundred people inside the park and you could like watch it in the videos, like protesters, like walking around inside the park and cops just like scrambling around to try to like, you know, like catch one person or like grab a backpack and they just can't control the situation. So they had to just let it go. And then like, I don't know, like I had one of the cops that ended up singling me out because I had a bullhorn and because I'm like five feet tall and they tend to single out, you know, little women because they think that we're going to be like easy and pushovers and whatever <laughs> the cop that like came to like tell me that i had to leave the park like right now was the exact cop who the weekend before i had been hit by a car at marine land <laughs> somebody just gunned their car through me and oh it made on purpose and my friend jeremy they flipped my friend jer over the hood and they ran over my foot and we had it on tape and we had the license number and somebody else at the demo called the police and the cop that came over to, like, take my statement about getting hit by the car and then told me that there was nothing he could do about it was the same cop who was trying to kick me out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh, now you're interested in, like, upholding the law. <laughs> and so it's like we can get away with quite a bit, but they also, like, they pass a lot of, like, kind of like quiet laws in the background that mess with us a lot or if you're the police chief of toronto you just pretend that they're laws and you tell everybody on tv that they're laws even though they aren't and then you illegally detain thousands of people at the g20 mm -hmm. because of these laws that don't really exist um which he did and did not actually get you know fired or anything for so it's really it's really a mixed bag um but, like, yeah, we don't have, I guess, like, I get so much more crap from the American officials than I do from Canadian officials, even though I'm Canadian. Well, isn't your, isn't your mayor a, a crack-smoking mayor? He is. He is an admitted crackhead. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, he's also, that's, like, all the talk here for some reason, the crack-smoking oh smoking mayor of Toronto. Rob Ford. Here's the thing is like we all hated Rob Ford before it was cool. Like he's been <laughs> our mayor for like three years. And we've had a problem with him since the, basically everywhere the subway touches did not vote for this guy. We have like downtown and then like a few like, a decade ago they amalgamated all of the suburbs that are still kind of connected by highways to Toronto into one mega city. So all those suburbs can vote for the mayor of like the whole you know, 5 million people. And so wow. um, he basically got elected by the suburbs. And so everybody downtown has been just like, since the moment he got elected, just like in shock because he's like, he beats his wife. He's the first mayor that's been kicked off of the police board because of a conflict of interest because the police were getting called to his house so much. Wow. <laughs> like, what? he's... He, he was, like, the single vote against, like, um, funding for an AIDS hospice in Toronto. It's, like, he's just, like, he's, like, cartoonishly evil. Um, and uh, and we've been we've been clashing with him since the beginning. When we got, he had our, our shark fin ban got overturned because he helped with the challenge to the shark fin ban. He was one of the, like, one of five counselors who voted against the shark fin ban. Like, um, why? <laughs> Because he said that it was it w the government shouldn't be regulating what people can eat, and that this was the first step in like an animal rights agenda in Toronto. Because we had just had a victory about moving the elephants from our zoo to Paws, um, and they're thankfully there now. But we had three elephants um, living in Toronto that were outdoors in the snow, um, and that are now happily living in California. So that's really nice. But yeah, he was accusing us of having an agenda to take away people's rights to eat meat and other such things. Um, <laughs> but a lot of smoking crack while he's smoking crack. And he also votes against like, like initiatives for people with substance abuse problems. And so all of us are just like, you smoke crack. <laughs> like, 
how can you how can you do this like and well, he might be implicated in a murder like there's a million things wrong with and him. isn't there like really weird laws where you can't just kick him out of being the mayor oh we can't that's the thing um he has to be convicted of a crime or be in breach of some sort of existing council rule to get kicked off of council he went to court he's been to court three times since he's been mayor um, and he almost got kicked out of office because he used his city hall letterhead to solicit donations for his football charity. Um, <laughs> this guy's a fucking winner. Like, no, but... And then he voted. And then when the council had a vote over whether or not he should be disciplined for having done this, he voted in that that vote, which you can't do because it's a conflict of interest. Like, you can't throw a vote in about if you should be disciplined or not. <laughs> And so that was a breach of council rules, and we almost got rid of him. The first, like, the first judge ruled that he needed to be kicked out of office. And I mean, then this the ego to do that. Right. He's, his ego is amazing. He rerouted one of our public transit buses, kicked all of the people off the bus, and drove it to the high school where he coached football to pick his football team up because their bus didn't show up. <laughs> He's, he sounds like a fictional character. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Like, this is the thing. is like, if anybody wrote this mayor, like, nobody would believe it. And Toronto's the biggest city in Canada. Like, it's a big deal, like, that that our mayor... And I mean, okay, and like, Toronto, like, we've got a history of crazy mayors. Rob Ford isn't even my favorite. My favorite was Mel Lastman. He was mayor when I was, like, a teenager. Mel Lastman, um, his wife, who was really, really into getting, like, public attention, um, went to the media and said that somebody broke into their house, injected her with poison, stole all of her jewelry in order to then inject her with the antidote. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they actually did a talk screen, they found that she hadn't been injected with anything <laughs> and that all of the jewelry she said was stolen was just hidden in her house. <laughs> And then later, right before he was getting elected for the second time, this, the newspaper here, the Toronto Star, which broke the crack story, um, called Mel Lastman and was like, listen, we found out you have a secret family in one of the suburbs of Toronto, which he did, like another, a second wife and kids. And they were like, we found <laughs> out about your secret family, and we're going to like blow this up tomorrow in the newspaper, so just heads up. So what does he do? He has like a late-night press conference gets both families up on stage with him, and he scoops their story by just admitting it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> how was how the, uh, the Republic reaction to the two families? Well, everybody was just like, at least he admitted it. At least the guy's, guy's human. Oh, he just like he came out and said it. He owned it. Gets reelected. Everybody's just like, he was honest. Wow. Holy like, fuck. People, so, they're so forgiving. I, I think The like, niceness of Canadians extends. <laughs> And so the reason why he's such a big deal here is because it's like comical amusement. It's like a reality TV show for us. Oh, yeah. And so he, like people view him as like a heroic and they, kind of person that they idolize because he's a yeah. crack smoking mayor. Oh, but, yeah. but they don't have to deal with the, <laughs> the bullshit. It's like nothing, literally nothing has been achieved at city council since he became mayor. He wastes so much time with all of his stuff. He. The media is like camped out at City Hall every day because every day he says something ridiculous. I'm <laughs> sure you guys heard him say um, that a woman in his office claimed that he wanted to eat her pussy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then he was like, I've got more than enough to eat at home. <laughs> All of us were that's, like, that's a politician. That's so absurd. And, and like, that's like, sounds like, like something I would be like, if I became mayor, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> And, like, and Americans, you guys can't even fathom this because, like, if you had a politician who even did one of these things, they were never, oh. like, George Bush almost lost an election because he smoked pot but didn't inhale. Like, the yeah. guy who was running against Rob Ford, who almost won instead of Rob Ford, is <laughs> gay, married to another man, and admitted to have done, like, ecstasy and coke when he was in his 20s because he used to hang out at, like, all these, like, gay clubs and stuff. And everybody was just like, well, I mean... He was in his 20s, hanging out at gay clubs. <laughs> like, nobody cares. And so, like, 
<laughs> it's like when 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 I see a politician in the states and they're like, oh, I had sex with somebody who wasn't my wife, and here I am with my hat in my hands, resigning. I'm just like, wow, you guys like, you really can't you can't deal with people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it happens so often now. It's and, it's only the Christian right. Like, yeah. That's what it all boils down to. Yeah, it's like, but these like we like Rob Ford is as right wing as they come. And we've like, even our right wing politicians, we've got right wing politicians who are, you know, like gay and married to in same sex relationships and things like that, like right wing people, Christian people, like it's really, it's really bizarre to, to like, it's bizarre to all of us over here when we watch because your election, we get so much American TV, we actually have a better understanding of your political system than our own. <laughs> I have to explain to people all the time that we don't vote for a prime minister here because people are like, there, you guys vote for like Barack Obama. Like you go to the polls and that's who you vote for. Here you vote for like the person in your neighborhood. And if like that many, like whoever's got the most from their party out of all the neighborhoods, they get their party head gets to be prime minister. Like if Stephen Harper died tomorrow, there's no vice you know, prime minister who steps into his place, they would just elect a new leader of their party. And that person overnight would be the prime minister of Canada. Okay. Like it has absolutely nothing to do with nobody in Canada elects Stephen Harper. Um, his party elects him and you elect all the people who are in his party. You know, like that's the way that our system works. And so it's really, we have a completely different system. And, um, and we watch the way that like you guys, when we elect an official, they get one debate. That's it. <laughs> They talk to each other <laughs> once. We get we watch your you guys are having debates. Like you debate your candidates until they like lose weight. Like they just like <laughs> burn lean calories just talking to Americans. <laughs> we sit here and we're like, this is interesting. <laughs> well, what's funny was when they're debating, it's just all bullshit anyways. Oh yeah. Like there's nothing of substance that's ever said. Yeah. My, and that's my... because you guys don't have follow-up questions either, which also blows our mind. Well, they don't have the follow-up questions because the politicians wouldn't agree to the debates unless they were predetermined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's, we, the whole thing is fucked up. We, I, we have, like, follow-up questions. You just get, like, one day to, like, spitball, like, everybody. <laughs> and then they, you know, toddle off. And our election's, like, four months. Like, that's the... <laughs> They they walk around for like four months, like shaking hands and do kissing. You, do you guys have the um the ask the prime minister sessions like they do in uh, the UK? No, we don't have like that that same sort of level of engagement. Um, municipal and provincial politics are way kind of more tightly knit. Like you can um, you can really get at your politicians um, sort of at the lower levels. Federal mm -hmm. politics um, it's much harder. Um, just because Canada is like so spread out and, um, and so like we have like five parties, um, so they can't give everybody that much like space and time. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really different, um, the way that we run our elections, but yeah, we don't have that same sort of like the Brits are really allowed to, to lay into them. I um, love watching it when they do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really awesome. When they're full on yelling at them, like it's fucking amazing. <laughs> well, uh, how how can people uh, get a hold of you and contact you? Um, to get a hold of and contact me, uh, probably, I mean, the easiest way right now is probably through email. Um, I also have like my bakery website. I'm constantly answering um, like all the messages and stuff that come through there um pretty rapidly um yeah so i guess um the bakery facebook is a good way um which is facebook slash apocalypse now and um and yeah there's like all my contact information is there sweet awesome. is, is there anything you would like to to leave everyone with um i don't think so i mean i <laughs> i feel like we spent a lot of time talking about Canadian politics. And stuff. <laughs> uh, so I guess like maybe just like I don't normally spend that much time thinking about Canadian politics as an anarchist. <laughs> I just, the whole thing is, <laughs> it's all silly. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, really paid a lot of attention during civics. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah, I guess I guess that would be the the takeaway is that like don't write me and ask me about Canadian politics because <laughs> I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> I think most anarchists care about politics more than they like to admit. I care, like, I care in the way that, you know, you care if somebody's, like, out in front of your house, like, breaking bottles. You, like, kind of lean out the door, like, stop doing that. (laughs) 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 It's it's really annoying. (laughs) But, like, not in the way that it's, like, I wake up in the morning and I'm, like, I must see what happened overnight and turn on CBC Radio 1 and, like, just, you know, lose myself. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we uh, we end every podcast saying, fuck shit damn. Would you uh, mind saying it for us? Fuck shit damn. Woo. This week we heard... Grammatic just jamming. Right now you're listening to... Black Mill friend and as always el commandantes which side are you on hey we'd really like it if you guys would uh check out our affiliate link to amazon at which podcast.com you buying anything online go to amazon go through our link first we'll get a kickback of everything you purchase online it, it really helps us out no it really does what's really great about it is that it doesn't cost you any more money no nope. amazon gets less money yep and we don't want you to use it unless you're already planning on using it so, so it doesn't really cost so it you doesn't anything. really cost you anything and amazon's not getting anything more because don't use it unless you already were going to and then we get a little and bit we get a little it. bit and we always put it back towards the pocket it's like stealing from a corporation Kinda, kinda. It's like getting a discount, and that discount going to a good cause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we would much prefer you to buy your stuff secondhand, Mm -hmm. locally produced. Mm -hmm. Do it yourself, make it yourself. Make it yourself. But if you're not going to or you can't, um, and you already are planning on using Amazon, hook us up. Yeah, use our link. I should start a... If my work ever buys something on Amazon, I should try to get them to use the affiliate link. Um, I just convinced one of our administrators to do that. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to use our link for everything they buy. I should start talking to my work. I bet they do it. Yeah. It's yeah. actually pretty, it's it's super simple. Yeah. And what's really great about it is that like, uh, if you have things in your shopping cart mm-hmm. and you have them saved, go through our link to purchase, it'll give us the credit for everything that's in your shopping cart. So you don't have to, you know, go through our link and then try to do your shopping. You can do your shopping over your week, save your shopping cart. Go through our link and buy it all. Yeah. Totally sweet. It's a good rule of thumb. Just click on our Amazon affiliate link whenever you're going to Amazon. You know, an extra step. Amazon is a great way to get, you know, vegan ethical chocolate. You oh, yeah. can't necessarily, you might not have a hard time finding in your local area. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Food Empowerment Project has some great chocolate bars. We just oh, tried my God. Some, uh, those caramel car- bars. The caramel ones are so good. Oh, yeah. Seriously. Hook us up with that if you guys want to. I will love you. Yeah, send us some of those too. That'd be cool. Yeah, totally. It's so it's good. the low priority on the list, but if you do it, then we'll hook. I you mean, up that's like obviously chocolate. the lowest priority. It's not like yeah. I need any more chocolate, but uh, yeah. it's pretty goddamn. Amazing. I would have in the past said to buy me some peanut chews, but they're they're working on their issues. They're so. no go. Yeah, they're working on their issues. So hopefully soon we'll be able to buy the peanut chews, but not the blue ones because we need to mosh against milk solids. Dude, this is the longest outro we've ever done. Yeah, it's longer than our intro, probably. Yeah, but it's okay. No one's listening if, anyway. If you did stick around, send us a tweet right now. Yeah. If you DM us right now and said, I stuck around till the very end, we'll throw in a surprise for you. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Fuck shit, damn. Fuck shit, damn. Witch Side is produced by the Witch Side Media Collective.